several years ago now, I, uh, just out of interest, made a phone call to my former boss slash partner slash very savvy, savvy and able developer friend, Scott Rutledge, and was surprised in engaging him in the phone call at how relaxed he was and chill and kind and listening and understanding and at one point, I just had to cut in, and I thought, Scott, what's happened to you? He'd evidently retired at age 50, two years younger than I am right now, but that's not what we're talking about. He's taken care of three places that he owns, one on Lake Muskoka, one in Etobicoke, one in Toronto somewhere, and managing all of his investments, because he was a really, really good real estate developer, brilliant guy, creative very driven, very focused, and most important for those of you who might know that industry, he just knew land and he had the touch and he could see a deal where no one else could see it and out of nothing create a beautiful retail or office or industrial development. He knew how to take risks. I recall when I was first hired and I went out for lunch with one of our contractors and he asked me to show him my hand because he wanted to make sure I still had all my fingers left working for Scott Rutledge. And uh, at first I didn't get it, but I've learned very quickly that he's not really a coach kind of empathetic, John, how you doing kind of leader guy. Um, even I, after a few weeks and months, became intimidated, the shrinking violet that I am. One day, he asked me to take a look at a set of plans for a project, a big project we were working on, a $100 million project, and said, make it better. I want a higher return on investment from this project. And so he would give me this big roll of plans. I'd take them back to my office, and I'd unroll them. And I would try to make the site more efficient. I'd add more building. I'd take away more landscaping. I'd move the parking around. I'd rearrange things in order to make it more efficient, more lucrative for us because the more square footage you have on a property, the more rent per square foot you're going to get, the more you'll then be able to capitalize when you flip the thing and sell it to some Chinese investors who were buying all the properties back in that day. So I took his drawings and I went back to the office and knowing who he was, I said, I'll show this guy. And I did. And he made hundreds of thousands of dollars more as a result of a day's work and effort on my part. Which is why I guess he's got three properties in Toronto and a cottage in Georgian Bay and I'm sitting in a 1,200 square foot house in Glenbrook. Why did I tell that story again? Oh yeah, it's interesting to see. Looking back, how such a hard-as-nails boss could bring out the best in me and up the level of my performance and drive and creativity in a significant and good way. And there was something about knowing how tough he was that pushed me to do whatever it takes to yield the highest return and to take a bigger risk pushed me past myself and inspired a greater creativity. Have you ever worked with a boss like that? Have you ever thought that life with God could be something like that? Jesus did, at least in a similar kind of way. He once spoke a parable to a whole bunch of people who had varying views of what the kingdom of God was like and who God was like in order to clarify what the kingdom of God is like and who God is like. And he spoke these words. There once was a man descended from a group from a royal house who needed to make a long trip back to headquarters to get authorization for his rule and then return. But first he called together ten servants, gave them each a sum of money, and instructed them to operate with this until I return. Twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. 
shouldn't have given it to the treasurer. He called ten servants together, gave them each a sum of money, and instructed them, operate with this until I return. But the citizens there hated him. So they sent a commission with a signed petition to oppose his rule. We don't want this man to rule us. And when he came back, bringing authorization of his rule, he called those ten servants to whom he had given money to find out how they had done. The first said, Master, I doubled your money. And the master said, Good servant, great work. Because you've been trustworthy in this small job, I'm making you the governor of ten towns. The second said, Master, I made 50% profit on your money. And he said, I'm putting you in charge of five towns. The next servant said, Master, here's your money, safe and sound. I kept it hidden in a cellar. To tell you the truth, I was a little afraid. I know you have high standards and hate sloppiness and don't suffer fools gladly. And the master said, you're right. I don't suffer fools gladly. And you've acted the fool. Why didn't you at least invest the money in securities so I could have gotten a little interest on it? And then he said, Jesus, to those standing. Well, then the master said to those standing there, take the money from him and give it to the servant who doubled my stake. And they said, but master, he already has double. And he said, that's what I mean. Risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of. Play it safe and end up holding the bag. As for these enemies of mine who petitioned against my rule, clear them out of here. I don't want to see their faces around here again. It's a great story. Maybe a familiar story. Maybe, if you know where this might be going, an uncomfortable story. It should be a bit unsettling. Its message, you're smart. You're already putting it together. What was Jesus trying to teach us about the kingdom of God, life with God through that story? That God in a way is like a nasty developer, a hard-as-nails boss that's going to hold you accountable. And you better watch your caboose. Is that what he's saying? Not entirely. I think the story is primarily about doing something with the gifts that God has given to you and taking risks in particular with the life that you're living and investing it in the right place. But I have been asking myself again this week, why tell it this way, Jesus, and why the nasty master, the, the hard, really hard, on that one non-risk taker, why that kind of boss? He is a bit like a land developer. And some theologians say, well, maybe it's because of the contrast. This guy's nasty, and he can get people motivated. Can a good God who isn't nasty there, shouldn't you even be all the more motivated for that kind of God? Another commenter said that maybe the master had to be tough because he inherited a nasty operation with the kind of people who were citizens there who hated him. They were backstabbing petitioners who were doing end arounds and playing political games in order to get away from his leadership. Maybe the master really wasn't that hard. He just had to act in that way because he had a bad lot to deal with. Or maybe he was one of those masters that was so good and so gifted and so right for the job that that dark, sinful, sinister part of you that is envious of people like that. Maybe that's what was going on. Maybe they hated that he was boss and they weren't. I am capable of that. Usually not when I start a job, but when I get to the part where I think I know everything, then I can be envious of what I then claim to see as a lack of 
character or competence or whatever in the person I'm working for. The Heidelberg Catechism that I grew up with, when it, when it talks about the nature of sin, says that I have, quote, I have a natural tendency to hate God and my neighbor, unquote. Could the real problem in this parable be we don't want to have a master at all? I'm the master. Maybe it's all of those things. God does care and will hold us accountable to the choices we make with, will hold you particularly accountable for the choices you make with your life, the life He's given you. And we're prone to be the kinds of citizens who mess up in relation to our leader. Regardless, the issue in this parable, in my reading of it, is still the question of what are you doing with what God has given you in your life, and you have been given something. How are you using what God has invested in you as an individual human being before God relating to others and as a communal member, if you're a member and part of this faith community, are you sticking your neck out and taking risks in faith? Are you living knowing that there will be a day where you will be standing before God and you will give an accounting of what you did with what He gave you? Knowing that God has very high standards, the highest, of course, and suffers no sloppiness. You've got a choice with your life right now. Today you do, again. Risk your life and get more than you ever dreamed of, or play it safe and end up holding the bag. Verse 